Hi, I'm Nicole Donnelly, and I'm going to speak about sculpt sculptural adaptations in hand paper making today. I am a hand paper maker and an artist. I came to hand paper making through the act of painting and drawing. And as a hand paper maker, I appreciate and love paper that is the most like paper that paper can be. However, as an artist, I love it when the imagery and the paper can become one. So as I speak to you today, all of the techniques described here are wet working, either manipulating the paper pulp or a wet sheet of paper before it has ever been dried. When I discovered embedding and inclusions between high shrinkage sheets of paper, this was early in my days of hand paper making and I realized that I could begin introducing imagery into the paper, making it transform beyond a substrate. When I realized that pulp could be pigmented and applied over the surface of a handmade sheet of paper like paint, I was intrigued. And as soon as I incorporated stencils, I realized that I could control that imagery more precisely and make it repeatable. Finally, those flat sheets of paper could be fold, stretched, uh, just draped over any kind of form to become a fully three-dimensional, highly realized object. And this is where I fell in love and where most of my explorations have been taking me in recent years. So as I work as an artist, I begin working flat two-dimensionally, creating pulp paintings in a series, working through as many uh, images at once as possible, up to 20 at a time, to create a cohesive body of work that is both thematic and color palette, creates a uniformity to the object I'm working over. But that is enough about my work because what I'm going to talk to you today is about how to adapt paper making to your sculptural practice. Um, and especially during the pandemic, this has taken a lot of different forms for us. Uh, for those of us without access to a Hollander beater, it means that we had to transform our practice in some ways. So in the essential tools and materials list, when looking at our workspace, we do not see a mold and decal. And this is because the paper pulp is the essential piece of this, uh, not necessarily a handmade sheet of paper. So the essential tools and materials, methyl cellu cellulose, which is our glue, containers, paper pulp, I've been working a lot with casting cotton, a ruler or straight edge, of course, the printed sheet of paper, which is still wet there, tweezers, plastic spoons, one inch chip brush, sponges, and of course, there are many more items that you can use, but I consider these to be essential. Uh, when taking a look at our low shrinkage fibers, these are important because these are what can be processed without a Hollander beater. We're looking at cotton linter, unbleached abaca, recycled papers, which may not be archival, but in fact, they are excellent at taking on form and they are abundant and makes excellent use of reusable materials. Of course, Kozo, Gampi, our, our bark fibers for paper making can all be processed by hand after cooking. Uh, these low shrinkage fibers and pulps can be processed in the Hollander beater with about 20 to 30 minutes beating time in a blender, usually five minutes or less without destroying your blender, and of course, hand beating for Kozo and Gampi. When we talk about high shrinkage fibers, most often we are looking at the use of those pulps or handmade sheets of paper over an armature. And for that, we're using raw flax with about four hours beating time, linen, which is spun from flax, and abaca, bleached or unbleached. All of these are processed in the Hollander beater for many hours. As I've been teaching sculptural papermaking for the last several years, I have broken out the sculptures into several distinct forms because this makes it easier to teach, but this is primarily where the paper sculpture sort of fits into. So we have hollow form, solid form, and armature. And as far as techniques go, we use pulp casting, sheet casting, sheet manipulation, embedding, and sheet stretching. 
So the hollow form can use high or low shrinkage pulps and papers. Uh, high shrinkage usually needs to be restrained in some way if you're casting into negative space. For solid form, we are looking at low shrinkage pulp, high or low shrinkage papers, and for armature, a high shrinkage or low shrinkage paper. I am going to focus primarily on hollow form throughout today, but we're going to take a look at some examples of each of these categories. When looking at hollow form, these two different artists here, Jill Powers on the left, Dominique Rousseau on the right, they are using COSO fibers cast around an object, releasing that object from it to build a vessel-like form that is both artistic and at once has a very common reference for most of us. Anita Breggins uh, uses a hollow form pulp casting using cotton, applying it to the exterior of objects to create ghostly forms that are then suspended in a room, creating partial still lives. The work of Will Cotton, editioned by Pace Paper, is also a version of hollow form pulp casting. These are paper cakes that were made in a silicone mold uh, the pulp was colored and each cake had its own mold. For hollow form sheet casting, we are taking the same idea of a found object or created mold and taking sheets of paper, applying them in layers to take on the surface texture and form of that object. Uh, hollow form sheet casting, on the left, we have a cat that was cast from a plaster mold. On the left, we have a rubber mold dog uh, that is fully three-dimensional. I will talk about uh, this dog in depth uh, later on in my presentation. And of course, solid form sheet manipulation. This is perhaps the most basic way that we can create sculptures from paper. We don't require the making of other objects or armatures. We can simply fold paper, tear it, and allow it to dry, creating a finished form. Uh, but of course, solid form sheet casting will create an object, apply and laminate those papers over that object. The papers can be pulp painted or pulp printed, as, as we see here on the right. And Solid form, the pulp can also be manipulated on the surface by tightly pinching or pushing that pulp into those thin ribbon lines that are standing up from the surface and allowing it to dry. By squeezing out the water, you can bring the pulp to a consistency that is almost like clay. And of course, color, pigment, paint, any kind of surface treatment can be applied to your object after it's dry. Armature and embedding. By taking cords and embedding it between two translucent sheets of high shrinkage abaca, Helen Hebert allowed these papers to dry, cut them into circular forms, and then attached each one of these objects to a larger sculptural form, creating a dandelion head. Armature and embedding. The artist Jocelyn Shadover embeds wires between the sheets of abaca paper, bending them into a form and then, allowing, and then allowing the paper to dry and do as it wishes, creating these floral or coral-like objects. Of course, the work of Peter Gentinar. Uh, in his work, bamboo splints are embedded between large sheets of pigmented flax paper on his vacuum table. The excess water is removed and after many years of practice and trial and error, he has developed a way of positioning these bamboo splints so that he can reliably know which way the sculpture is going to dry and form and to help coerce it to take those forms. Of course, the paper can be stretched over a built armature, much like paper is stretched over a lamp form. On the left, we have COSO paper, which is a low shrinkage fiber. And on the right, we have high shrinkage abaca, which then also bends and contorts an armature uh, if it is relatively weak. So the techniques that I mentioned, we're going to start with pulp casting. You can use this in hollow and solid form sculpture. 
Excess water is removed from the pulp. You mix in methyl cellulose until it feels creamy. And it, this allows you to pat and shape the pulp over an area of an object or over an entire surface. You apply it in overlapping sections and then sponge it dry as needed. And uh, here we are going to look at the textural effects of an exterior or positive cast versus the interior or negative cast. For the exterior cast, we can see that paper texture coming through the pulp. That is because the outermost layer of the pulp was exposed. The, in, the interior of that object, the pulp was pressed directly against the surface of it. On the right, we have pulp that was pressed into a plaster relief and then removed. So the plaster side is very smooth and the back side, which we do not see, would have that finely undulating pulp texture. Also, when we are looking at pulp casting, the recipe for your pulp is very important. The wrong recipe on the left was highly beaten. It caused the sculpture to shrink back from the mold and to break in certain areas. On the right, we have the right recipe. This involved a shorter beating time, a higher roll setting on the Hollander beater, and the addition of calcium carbonate. Here is a brief demo to see pulp casting in action. I'm patting the pulp between my hands and applying it over this mug, which was already painted with methyl cellulose. You can see I am evening out these areas of pulp with my fingers. And as I fix that seam, I can also shape the edge of the pulp. I'm sponging it dry. And of course I could cover the entire object, but that is not always desirable depending on what the finished form of my sculpture will take. Our next technique is sheet casting or laminating. And this can be used for hollow or solid form. We generally pull an art weight sheet of paper. So it's going to be a little bit stronger and thicker and as many as you need to cover your surface, then pressing out the excess water. The thickness of your paper is determined by the ratio of pulp to water in the vat. More pulp and less water equals thicker paper. Working in sections, we paint methyl cellulose over the form, covering it in overlapping sheets of paper. You chase the air from between the paper and the object, paint overlapping areas of paper with methyl cellulose, and for better adhesion, even tear the decal off of your sheet of paper to expose the fibers. This is a sheet cast of a low relief wood block using handmade sheets of Kozo paper. You can see the fine detail picked up in the carving of the block. Here is a brief demonstration of sheet casting in action. This is using an unbleached abaca with recycled paper pulp. And I am draping this over a very dimensional object using a sponge and a brush to help press that wet paper into the valleys of the sculpture. In areas where the paper breaks, I take small pieces of paper to patch and repair those areas, drying it seamlessly. Now I would like to talk about molds and casts because oftentimes we want a way to find something, to find a way for it to be repeatable. And the cast is an excellent way to do this. So we begin with a founder constructed object, your sculpture, which may be vulnerable to water. But if we create a mold or impression of that object in a material that resists repeated exposure to water, we can create dimensional paper artworks that are repeatable. The handmade paper cast creates a replica of the founder constructed object and the mold is used to capture and reproduce fine details. With the exception of plaster, I use methyl cellulose to coat my mold to release the paper cast later. 
Materials for our molds, uh, common ones are plaster, wood, rubber or silicone with a plaster support, fired clay, Sculpey, polymer clays, and more. A paper cast can be made from a clay mold. This has the advantage that a raw clay can be pressed into any other object or surface to take an impression. You can build, continue to build that object, transforming something that is simple to something sophisticated. And looking at the work of Leonardo Drew, his sculptures begin as amalgams of wood and branches and roots. He creates a mold from these sculptures and then a three-dimensional paper pulp cast is made from those molds. And these works are two-dimensional, three-dimensional, beautifully intricate works to see in person. Even in photograph, they're impressive. I highly encourage you to check them out. On the bottom right, we have the silicone mold. On the bottom left, we have a paper cast made from it. And the last work that I'm going to show you is the process of creating Sarah McAnini's dog, Mango. I am a collaborator in hand paper making for the Brodsky Center at PAFA. And Sarah McAnini began working with me in 2020 at the time the pandemic started. So our project had to be put on pause, but that allowed me to create the five piece mold from her sculpture of the dog, which is very dimensional. So the steps to create this mold are sealing the sculpture, applying a release agent. You determine where the pieces of the mold are going to uh, liquid rubber. And then you apply the two-part liquid rebel cast of that sculpture. The plaster mother mold uh, must also be in place to support the flexible rubber. Otherwise, the rubber loses its original shape. So we trim the rubber to even edges, build clay walls to contain the plaster, following those original seams, and apply sisal dipped in plaster for added strength. Plaster can be very brittle. We apply a smooth coat of plaster over the sisal, apply Vaseline as a release between plaster mold pieces, and then we chase the plaster seams to even and smooth it out. Here is the five piece mold with a paper pulp cast of mango. But what we eventually decided on was a sheet cast of mango the dog with certain areas pulp cast to give added detail and dimension. So Sarah made these deeply pigmented sheets of paper. Uh, I made them 500 GSM. She applied four coats of pulp paint, each of them 40 by 50 centimeters. And these were produced in an addition of 40 to create 16 sculptures. So each sculpture requires two full sheets of paper and areas of pigmented paper pulp. And I'm going to show you a very sped up video now of how this sculpture is made. So in the space of a minute and a half, you will see a process that takes an hour and a half to two hours in total. I am laying the rubber mold into the plaster and assembling the five pieces of the mold together tightly. We use clamps to hold the mold closed while we're working in it and to prevent any material from seeping between the cracks. Flipped over on its other side, right now I am applying the areas of pigmented pulp into the ear, the collar, eyes, nose, and tail. I'm painting it with methyl cellulose so that my first sheet of paper can slide in and I can begin pressing it in with my fingers and a sponge. I am specifically leaving a deckled edge over the lip of that mold as I work. And this helps the whole piece stay in place while it dries without warping. I'm applying methyl cellulose to the legs and shoulders and laying in those legs one of which is almost completely three-dimensional 
in the round. So the methyl cellulose was essential to having the papers slide into place, rolling it in. As I press everything in tightly, I check for any holes or any areas that need patching and repairing. I finish adding sheets of paper to complete that deckled edge. And we set it on a fan, it takes three days to dry completely because the head and the ear are so dimensional. I remove the plaster and finally peel away the flexible rubber. And here is our finished mango. So this is Mango Mango, created in an edition of 16. And that is all of my presentation for today. Thank you so much for your attention and enjoy the rest of the Congress. <laughs>